Was my feet. Oh, my legs are too it's short. They don't bad. reach the bar stool thing. That's the test. And I'll just yell. That's fine. You happy with that there? I should have water. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Well, the wine's going to wet my whistle. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so this is a little bit unusual just to start us off because. Um, where's Chris gone? She's going to introduce me. I know, I've heard of So, um, we're expecting more people. We think there's been a bit of a COVID backlash given it's our first one back. Normally the room would be quite full. Um, we are recording it, so we'll go on our website and everything. But make some more relaxed conversation and lots of questions afterwards. So. Do you want to take it before I can do the rest? Oh, yes. It's up to you. Hey. <laughs> Sorry. Mine is the first priority. Um, welcome, welcome. I'm Chris. Um, I've been around for about a few years now. We're going to have everyone here. I'm just going to introduce Jill, who is our fabulous uh, MCD. Um, Jill is a media communications consultant in the development sector. A particular interest in with our guest speakers tonight. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we're on and that we're gathering on today. Um, and of course in Melbourne here, um, we are paying our respects to the elders, both present and emerging, uh, with our um, extending that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and being in Melbourne, we are on the land of the Wurundjeri people. Okay. So we're here to discuss volunteering and volunteering It's our last, our first one back face to face, our first event back face to face. We haven't been had a face to face since May um, when we were last here enjoying our wine and our pizza and a room full of really good, robust discussion. Um, but we thought it would be good to finish off the year with a chat about volunteering and e-volunteering, which has become very relevant obviously in our pandemic world. So volunteering and, and even internships are a common way for those who want a career in aid and development to get started, get a foot in the door. So Australian volunteers are the face of what we perceive as volunteers, and we're all told about volunteering, we think about Australian volunteers going and working overseas in the sector. Um, and Australian volunteers have been part of, the, of, of that process for the past 60 years. Yep. Past six years, um, their time, their skills, which is very important, and their experience in those volunteering roles uh, to help developing nations, a range of different developing countries and nations around the world. So volunteering can both um, benefit the volunteer as well as the communities that they work in, that work in inverted commas, I guess you would say, um, and, and do in fact build relationships and friendships. And I know from my own experience with Vanuatu, which is still ongoing on a daily basis, um, the impact, the major impact that that can have on your life in terms of volunteering, uh, both on a personal level as well as a professional level, um, and, and affecting the view you have of the world as a, and the way it works. 
Um, currently overseas volunteering, obviously, as I said, is under, they've been fairly obviously affected by COVID-19, by the global pandemic, um, which I'm sure Claire will tell us about and, and talk about um, uh, in our discussion. Um, but there are still opportunities that can be had to keep that uh, the idea of volunteering and the assistance we can offer during that period and the support we can offer to in-country programs so they don't completely destroy <coughs> Um, so we'll also talk tonight all about an interesting element. Um, I'm just trying to think of a couple of my students here tonight and I'm thinking they might, I've talked about this briefly to say in some classes, uh, the difference between engaging in meaningful volunteering and the importance of avoiding to some degree uh, short-term unskilled volunteering, which often happens you hear the stories about orphanage volunteering and what has become known as volunteerism. Um, um, which will affect, can affect to a great degree children, obviously, in that effect. Um, and Karen might speak to that um, when we get talking about that in terms of the effect on children and things like volunteerism. That tends to be one of the main areas of concern, um, as well as putting other communities at risk. So, um, like I say, I'm sure our spoke at both our speakers here will share their experiences that have shaped their careers in the aid and development sector and talk about. Um, some of those aspects. So let's get on with then and introduce um, our key speakers. So we have Karen and Claire. So Karen Flanagan is from Save the Children. Karen is their principal advisor for child protection. She's one of the Australia's foremost child protection advocates and as a qualified social worker, and I'll say for over 30 years, I've got the number, but I'll say over 30 years. Um, it's a lot. Sorry? A lot over, a lot. but anyway. <laughs> well over 30 years. Um, <clears throat> of clinical, managerial training and research experience in child protection and safeguarding, which is really crucial, especially when we're talking about volunteering. Um, in her role, Karen's involved in program design and capacity building for both staff and partners, both nationally and internationally, um, all as part of ensuring children's safety and their protection. So we'll hear more from Karen. Uh, shortly on um, that aspect of our topic tonight. And so Karen's also then joined by Claire. So Claire McClellan here. So Claire's from ABI, which we all know is Australian Volunteers International, where she works um, in, as a communications manager for the volunteers program. Claire's now spent several years in the not-for-profit sector, working across a range of areas, and, <coughs> um, as we were discussing before, some of which touch on very familiar territory for me. <laughs> which is communications, partnerships, program support and fundraising. Uh, and for the last three to four years, Claire has been broadening um, awareness of the ABI program, putting the messages out there, both in Australia and overseas, uh, and looking to increase stakeholder engagement, which is no easy task, um, and facing all the challenges, of which there are many, <laughs> that come with that. Um, so I will now throw over to our guest speakers. We might start with Karen, if you'd like to start, in terms of giving us a bit about your experience and a bit about um, your, your, your work at Save the Children and how that relates to the sort of relationships you have around volunteering and, and those experiences. Thank you. Thanks all for coming tonight. Well, I am a social worker and I'm very proud to be a social worker. I had no training in international development whatsoever and I was halfway through my career when I realised, oh, I want to go and work overseas, but I didn't know about international development really, but I knew about protecting children and there seemed to be a, a big gap there. Um, and as many of you might know, child protection is the newest sector, um, maybe followed by climate change, is one of the newest technical sectors in international development. So therein lies how I got my little sneak into international development. I happened to be around at a good time and we highlighted the need for child protection safeguarding, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. I also want to acknowledge the traditional landowners um, on where we meet today, and particularly um, acknowledge children who are not just um, of the future, which politicians like to say, they're of today, and that's the reason I get up out of bed every day, is to try and do something to improve the rights and well-being and participation of children. So um, I grew up in Northern Ireland, if you hadn't already worked that out. <laughs> I should have just uh, asked, did a straw poll of the room. <laughs> but I've been in this country for more than 36 years and um, 
Rarely do people from Australia ever get my accent right. They usually think I'm Canadian, Scottish, Air, uh, American. Seriously, seriously. And it's actually people from other countries that would get it right nine times out of ten. So it's just a wee bit interesting. Anyway, um, I've been here um, for a long time, pretty much. But the reason I came here was not by design. That was a love story, but we we'll, that's another story for another day. But I ended up marrying a Northern Irish Protestant, and I'm a Catholic. And if you know anything about the history of where I grew up, <laughs> that in itself was um, an interesting story. But um, here we are. Um, so my mother was a social worker, but tried to stop myself and my sister becoming social workers. Said it's too hard. It's not well enough paid. There's no rewards in it. And of course, the more your mother tells you not to do something, the more you're going to do it. Um, hence, my sister and I ended up. Um, but really, the reason I think we've all ended, and we've all taken different, I've stayed in shop protection, but my family and my friends who started in social work, I think us Irish were known, we are fighters, we like fighting. And from I was six or seven, I was fighting for civil rights, for Catholics to get public housing, for Catholics to get jobs. And I didn't know what that was really meant. I would say to Dad, what does it say on that banner, Dad? What are we marching for today? But the point is, hence my journey began when I was, you know, at school basically advocating for rights. And then I learned about them. So through my social work uh, training, I also learned about advocacy, even though we, I don't even think we used that word. I really don't know what we talked about then. But all I knew is we were doing it um, somehow. Um, and I was just saying earlier that, you know, I was learning, you know, policy legislation, economics. I'm thinking, I just want to help children. Why do I need to know all this stuff? But of course, I've used it all. So the message I always say when I do talk to students is half of it makes no sense. It takes you until you're about 50. <laughs> Standing it, so just get on and just do what you think's best. Really, um, I'm a, I, I'm a learner by doing. So I started off in frontline statutory child protection in West Belfast on the Falls Road um, in Belfast, and that was okay because I was Catholic and with a name like Karen Flanagan, I could get easy access. But when you had to go to the Shankill Road, and that's Protestant, and there's still a peace line to this day, to this day, that was a wee bit tricky. And we went out on our own and I was removing people's children mm. at the ripe old age of 22 yeah. with my, okay, I had five years education, that should do it, shouldn't it? Well, I would go to court and I, when I look back and think, I removed 12 children one day in my car. That's even illegal, doing that many children in a car, but that's the kind of stuff we used to do. So I think that points to resilience and learning. Um, it was literally a baptism of her. And when I got to Australia, I thought I was in Sleepy Hollows. I thought, God, it's all good here. It's really civilized. <laughs> nobody's shooting at me. Nobody's throwing stones at me. Nobody's stealing my car when I do a home visit. It's great. It's easy. Um, I started working, oh, I forgot to say, I work in Bernardo's, which is where my interest in sexual abuse prevention came in. And that's been the main part of my career is trying to stop sexual abuse um, of children and I've worked with victim survivors and perpetrators and worked with boys and men and my feminist friends and colleagues wouldn't speak to me. I had years of being out in the wilderness doing this work back in the early 80s um, and now nobody would think not to do that so I've been a huge advocate for that side of the work. Um, so I've been reinventing what I've been doing. I've just got interested in areas and when there's gaps, I tried to fill them. So hence when I was here, I did, um, I worked for the Children's Protection Society for 10 years, set up Australia's first community-based treatment program for young people with sexually abusive behaviors. Again, I had to go to America. I wrote to somebody because there was no email. I'd read a book, wrote to somebody, and she said, I do a six day course. It was the only training in the world to work with that group of kids. And I came back and I thought, I'm doing this. No idea what I was doing. I got some money from the department and off I went. And luckily we did an evaluation and that yielded really positive results. And I just kept writing to politicians. But more importantly, I was getting children and young people to talk to politicians and people from Treasury. I wasn't doing the talking, I was getting them to talk. So nowadays we call that child participation. I, again, just did what felt right and kept going. Um, and we published all the results of that. So that led to uh, people from other countries starting to show interest in my work 
and then I started thinking, I'd like to go to those countries too. So that's my pathway into international. Child protection and safeguarding wasn't heard of really in international development back then. And I worked for an organization called Childwise. Um, it's ECPAT, E-C-P-A-T. It stood for End Child Prostitution, Pornography and Trafficking. But nobody really, people in Australia would go, what's that got to do with us? I go, well, it's you people that are going over and abusing children in other countries. That's what it's got to do with us. We're the senders. We're the senders of the people who do that. So we're the supply. And the more we supply tourists to do that, the more the demand for children will grow. So that will lead me into trafficking and orphanage trafficking. Um, but back then, our focus was really on making people accountable for the programs they were running and DFAT. Uh, AusAid it was known as then, um, AusAid DFAT. AusAid, we kept saying, you've got all these scandals, well, you've got diplomats, you've got employees who are sexually abusing children, you're doing nothing about it, and you're giving money to charities like Save the Children, like World. Uh, and I'm not saying, we've all had our issues in our organizations, you all know that. But we said, you need to p hold people accountable. So after yet another scandal, uh, they called us in and I got to write um, the world's first, actually, child safeguarding policy for international mm -hmm. development as a home donor. So it was me who was contracted in to write what we now call the DFAT child protection policy. It's really safeguarding, because the difference is safeguarding is about the organization's responsibilities, whereas protection's family and community. But they still insist on calling it that. DFAT refused to be part of it, which is funny, but then DFAT subsumed Aussie, and now mm -hmm. they've got the policy they never wanted, but that's mm -hmm. a whole other story. Um, so that's where I started. So my job at Childwise, I was on the board of Childwise, so that was my entry point into international. I wanted to get involved more in the overseas stuff because of my skill set in sexual abuse and child protection and ultimately safeguarding. Bernadette McMenamin at the time saw that was a gap in the international sector and she brought me in. So I was on the board and then we got a, I got a paid position eventually to roll out Choose With Care, which we wrote, which was again one of the first safeguarding packages in the world. And the principles and the standards for Australia are all taken from that. All the Royal Commission work, that is taken from it. The Victorian Royal Commission, the Federal, and I gave expert testimony in both of those. But nonetheless, I think we were ahead of our time in the international development sector for child safeguarding, more so than domestically, which is pretty horrifying when you think of how much money we have here and the money that is pumped into child protection. Um, so I better get into talking about orphanage traffic and tourism. So on top of my day job of being the principal advisor at Save the Children, I've been there for 12 years. I was at Childwise for seven. I am a stare, you know. <laughs> I thought, somebody was asking me, what are you going to do next, Karen? I gone, I would just like to travel again. That's all I want to do. But for the last 17 years, I, well, until COVID, I literally was traveling once, if not twice a month overseas. Now, I do have a family, but the boys will tell that story another day. I think they were glad to see the back of me. If I was home for more than two weeks, they say, is she going soon? <laughs> but I was literally overseas, if not easily once a month, if not twice. Um, but my husband stayed at home and so the kids were not deprived, I can assure you, regardless of what they might say. Um, but it wasn't, and COVID, like two years at home in Aspendale in a smaller house because we downsized and then my boys came home to live with us and brought a dog and all their <laughs> trucks, utes, boats, paddleboard. And I'm going, and I'm in this house this time. So I've gone from global to Aspendale. So... I'm amazed I'm still here. I think my husband is lucky to be alive, but no, I think it worked out all right. But I think it was probably meant to be, really, in many ways, even though it's a terrible thing. But doing the work, if you'd ask, how, how can you do that work through a computer? I don't know either. How can you protect children through computers? But we're doing it. We're somehow doing it. A lot of WhatsApping, a lot of um, creative mechanisms. And my funniest story is, whenever COVID was really at its worst and our Cambodian staff were saying, no, we're going out to the village, kind of going, you're not going out to the village, you'll get COVID. Oh no, we got PPE. I'm going, you're not going out to the village because you don't know what's out there. And they go, no, it's okay. We've got the PPE and we've got a moto and we've got a megaphone and we're going to shout all the parenting without violence messages. So they're literally saying, don't hit your children. Don't hit your children. 
in came I. And I'm, I'm caricaturing it, but that's effectively what we were doing. And people were coming out to listen to the messages still, you know. So we had lots of WhatsApp groups and whatever way we could do it. And our staff are amazing. And I've got programs in probably about 12 countries that um, I oversee. But about five or six years ago, um, I was approached by a dear friend, Lee Matthews and Rebecca Nepp, who again were involved in the whole volunteerism thing and they both set up charities. In fact, two of them had set, two of my other friends had set up orphanages and realized these children are not orphans. What are we doing? Mm. This is so unsustainable. And two of them were lawyers and realized when, the, when they learned to speak the language, um, the children said, they were asked them one day, oh, you look really sad, what do you want? And they said, we just want to go home. And they said, but you have no family. They said, well, yeah, we do, but we've been told never to say we have. And basically their identities were falsified and they were trafficked. So that's when Dr. Kate Van Door, who's um, one of the authors of this book that we wrote, um, was released just pre-COVID. So we've all put this together. Um, but Kate and Andy, her partner, they tell their story about setting up an orphanage. Um, Lee tells about her charity that became unsustainable. Again, all good people who wanted to do good things, but learned, you know, hard lessons the whole way through. The happy part of all of that is all of those kids have been reunited with their families and we've had 60 Minutes of Current Affair, we've had Sally Sarr, we've had all, all the people that have been on documentaries and Tara Winkler, CCT, all of those stories have been well told and books have been written and there's going to be a movie written, Tara's life's going to be written as a movie. Mm -hmm. But this group of women, there was five of us and we started Rethink Orphanages in my lounge room. So we've been doing a lot of advocacy. Um, and we were instrumental in getting orphanage trafficking and tourism recognised as a form of modern slavery whenever Australia introduced its first modern slavery legislation. So we worked with Linda Reynolds, who was then a senator, then she became minister, and now she, she was minister for um, foreign affairs. No, no, um, what was Linda? Before she became NDIS, before she had the downfall, mm. the, the awful downfall. Yeah, we won't talk about that. Mm. Um, what was, oh my God, what was Linda, Minister for Defence? Defence, Defense, Defense, that's right, yeah, Defense, yeah, that's right. But she was really a big advocate on this issue because we took, we take politicians overseas to influence them to be pro-aid. Bill Gates finds that, or funds that. Um, so Linda was telling the story, of, oh my kids have just gone to an orphanage and they were going to Cambodia and then my boss said, oh, you better speak to Karen. And it was really funny because I was coming back from Cambodia, or from Tha somewhere in Thailand. They were coming back from Cambodia and I met them in the airport and I could hear my boss yelling, Karen! And I'm going, oh, I don't want to meet my boss at midnight in a pair of leggings and my schleppy t-shirt that I sleep in. Oh God, and he's got politicians with him. And I'm just like, oh, I'm going, great. Paul's yelling, come on, Karen, come on. So I met Linda at the airport that night and she said, oh, Paul's been telling me about the work you've been doing with Rethink Orphanages and I said yes and we've also got one of our group who's putting forward the first legal argument as to why it's a form of modern slavery. So we got involved with her and helped push this through the um, whole right, now it's not written in the legislation but it's part of the, the business principles. So business is over 10 a uh, hundred is it a hundred million? I get this number wrong because ten million, a hundred million makes no difference to me. It may as well be ten dollars, but it's a hundred million businesses who bring in more than that have to report against these con these um, principles, and you have to check your supply chain to see if you if you're running a uh, residential facility or an orphanage or a private school or whatever. But there's a lot of names for orphanages, boarding schools, etc. But it's a way of keeping businesses accountable now it's only a small small step but it's a world first and it will improve in the next drafting of the next legislation um, but we worked with Linda Reynolds on that and th those business principles we've also worked with the Australian um, Charities Commission on the external conduct standards so that if you start a charity which is what a lot of volunteers do start their own charity money comes from Australia, you come back, you do your wine and cheese nights, you re get all your friends to fund it. And yes, it's all legit, but there's, got, there's much more stringent conditions on that. And if children are involved, then there's more conditions. But the problem is with that, it's not being monitored, so people are not really accountable. So we're still doing a lot of advocacy behind the scenes on that. Um, what we know is COVID has, I mean, pre-COVID, children were in institutions 
Research across the world shows 80 to 90 percent have at least one living parent, if not two. So they're not orphans, that's myth number one. Secondly, yes, go on holidays, yes, do good, but whose needs are you meeting? Is it your need to feel good about yourself? Because clearly we know and it's just interesting a couple of the colleagues who were involved in this book have done a piece of research in five countries about the impact of covid on residential facilities orphanages and the like so when there was the big hard lockdowns and government were you know government either just opened the doors of some institutions said go and the kids didn't know where they were going they didn't know where they came from so more kids ended up in the street but at best they stayed some of them stayed and the, in this piece of research um, done by Kate Van Door and Rebecca Knepp shows that the children have fared far better without the well-meaning tourists meddling in their lives every day. Attachments, which is the key issue that we've got about why we shouldn't have residential facilities anyway. Um, but they've been not disrupted. The only thing that they miss is the money. And this is my point, if you want to do good, just give money to reputable charities or reputable organizations that will spend it properly. Because when you give it to smaller private institutions, etc., we've had stories where children were literally eating rats and being starved, and yet people in Sydney thought they had this beautiful mm. u -Butte orphanages and the kids are all on iPads and getting an education. All sorts of horrible stories. So it's about that whole accountability mechanism. How am I, I've probably taken more than my time. Just tell me to shut up when I have to. Just, okay, wind it up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, um, I mean, I didn't, like I didn't write, a, I, I never write speeches, but I had loads of points, but I don't, I think the point is um, for volunteer, volunteer, I should say volunteers, not volunteers, but um, basically we need to question the ethics of doing good and for what, end is it really about and there's lots of lee matthews does great podcasting the do gooder podcast series um, and explores the art of doing good and what what does that really mean we did a big piece with the education department we got simon birmingham who was then federal minister to write a letter well we wrote it and said please send this um, we got them to say to schools you will cease and desist from taking kids to orphanages anymore so we worked with world challenge which was the biggest um, organization um, doing tours for children going to orphanages so I mean Catholic my kids went to St. Bates College we were always doing fundraisers for the kids to go on those world challenge trips I was always on the plane with the kids and the teachers and going oh my god they're going to orphanages and I'd be up talking to teachers um, but we're, we've stopped schools we've literally written to schools um, and the Victorian Education Department have, have basically put a stop to it so we did that so we've stopped it for, but private schools can still do what they like at the end of the day, and some will continue to do that, especially the faith-based organizations. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of my work is about system strengthening in countries. So the work I do for Save the Children is working with governments to say, you need to protect your most vulnerable, you need to make sure that children are primarily with families, and if their own family can't care for them, what are you doing to support them? You need to be, you know, giving them social protection, child sensitive social protection, targeting kids with disability, etc., so they don't end up in terrible institutions. So in Indonesia, for example, there were half a million children in care. 95% uh, of them had parents. And it was purely because it was the government strategy, poor kids go to institutions. I go, well, that's unsustainable in a country of this size with these numbers. How many more of these are you going to build? So we've started doing um, parenting without violence, uh, making sure they get access to protection, cash benefits, etc., school, clothing, or whatever they need. So poverty is not a reason to put a kid in an institution, uh, nor is abuse or neglect, because there will be other families. So we've done a lot on foster care, kinship care, etc. So in all the countries I'm working, mainly Southeast Asia and the Pacific, but we're doing this across the world, it's all about making sure that the government recognizes children's rights to grow up in a family, a safe family, preferably in their own community. Why should we take them out? If someone's abusing them, and I've worked with perpetrators for 30 years, take the perpetrator out, they caused the problem. Not the child, not the woman, no. Take the perpetrator out and hold them accountable and do your proper case management to work out what the family needs are. So. 
I could rant on about this all night, as you can see, um, and I'm sorry if it didn't make much sense, but the legal policy reform is critical. So that's our system strengthening work we do all day, every day. But COVID has shown we've now got a window, two years where no travel, no volunteerists, and people have had a chance to step back and see that it has had a positive impact for children, but they still want our money. So now what are we going to do? Because we've got the money. What are we going to do? So we need to be wise with that. It's interesting to see where the silver linings have come out of the pandemic. Some of these silver linings where everyone has had to stop and pause and just stay within their own space um, and let things unravel the way that would normally unravel in terms of, or unfold I should say, um, in terms of communities being communities just within their own space. So many questions to ask you out of that, but I'll just ask one or two. Um, the main one, just out of interest, is what sort of countries, if you were looking at addressing, you know, well-intentioned volunteers, we want to call it volunteerism, whatever you want to call it, but what are the main countries they were aiming at, where it was bordering on helping, let's say, orphanages or going and doing, you know, good work, as we say, for orphanages, and then bordering on the issues, which is a complete other issue of, of trafficking and stuff and sexual Mm. Well, we think orphanages Australia, we started Rethink Orphanages, but now it's global and we've got it everywhere. Um, so our focus was on Southeast Asia and the Pacific, but there's not a lot of institutional care in the Pacific, no. some, and we're, we want that to not grow yeah. because of, we definitely want that to not grow. So the usual suspects, Cambodia, Thailand, the Philippines, Bangladesh, Myanmar was just, it was going mental really? until the con, oh, it, as soon as it opened up, Wow. It was new territory for, okay. oh, it just started going on. And AVI, my colleague Fiona Williams, who also wrote the... My colleague child, now. Yes, that's <laughs> Oh, sorry, I meant yours, but yes, she was mine. And she worked with me in childhood. Her and I go way, way back. Oh, fantastic. So Fiona, um, AVI have started a volunteering hub. A, a child safety volunteering hub. But Myanmar was one of the places, but now with the conflict, it shut down again, so okay. tourists can't go there. But South America, it's rife. Uh, Africa, it's rife. It's, it, it's everywhere. Russia. So um, the European Union, uh, Europe, have kind of cut it down. Do you remember after uh, Sarajevo and all of that? Mm. Um, there was all the Bosnian refugee, the orphanages. They have completely deinstitutionalized. I mean, okay. we've deinstitu. We don't use institutional no, care anymore. No, no. So why do we think it's okay to support it somewhere else if it's not good enough for our children here? Why? It's, why is it good enough for others? But it's it's a global issue. Yeah, it's yeah. a global issue. So that's changing the face of, of volunteering. I mean, in some ways, as you see, volunteering is now turning towards helping you address that problem, yeah. as opposed to whether it be inadvertently actually being part of the problem. I think, and I think just one more quick thing and I'll mm. stop. Uh, so I think we've got, young people are educated about this. Our kids know, um, I'm sorry, I'm really old, so I don't mean to be you know, patronizing, but you know, my so my son's like nearly 30 and my other son's 25 26 and they and all their friends know that it's not cool to go to orphanages anymore and because we've done the work with all the education departments both federally and state level and we've developed a whole lot of resources for schools so it's it's in their curricula now um, and we tell them how to plan a trip so go overseas travel learn about the world but do not go to orphanages there's a whole heap of other things you can be doing to be ethical travelers and tourists but my friend who was meant to be here tonight she's doing her own research and she's in the travel industry and her specialty is baby boomer travel and guess what she did a survey guess what the number one issue for uh, middle-aged women in particular of course we want to volunteer in orphanages I'm like, oh my god I have to get out now and do a whole other thing so it's it's um, it's my age that we have to, mm. the silver divorcees, the, the empty nesters, the that stuff, yeah. but they're trying to create meaning, but not yes. that way, there's plenty of other ways. No. <laughs> so anyway, that's a whole other trajectory. So but I was gonna say, I was interesting just before, before we get on to- Sorry. Sorry. No, I there's a whole it's lot really of interesting. questions about it. Was, how do you address that? I mean, people are being well-intentioned. They've, they've had a busy working life, especially like you say, people in that age group mm. who are wanting to just get out and do things. Tra and we came across them in, in volunteering. I'm sure Catherine, you've come across them as well. When you volunteer, um, 
there are people of all age demographics, but there is a lot who are that over 55 mark who are out there because they've done their work life and they don't want to sit, they don't want to play golf and they don't want to sit at home and knit or, you know, muddle around with grandchildren or whatever, they want to go out and do some good, mm. which is fine if you're taking a volunteer role of helping in health or policy writing or whatever mm -hmm. it is, but there will be some who want to go and do things and work quickly with Quickly too, they yes. want a quick trip, quick trip. So how do you quickly address, how do you try and nip that in the bud to, or is that just a long, longer conversation in terms of the well-intentioned? Well, I think, yes, it it's probably is a longer conversation, but I think it is the education piece because once people realise the impact it's having, and that it's breaking attachments of children and it's creating um, other issues. Most people are horrified and will mm. want to cease and desist, but they equally do want to know what they want to do. And that's the bigger question. Yeah. So maybe but we like, should have another talk about that. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I guess that's also where Claire comes in, in terms yeah. of um, roles like AVR, mm -hmm. where you're turning to volunteer institutions, the, the, the organisations rather, that facilitate volunteers and placements that they're being made more aware of this. Yep. And so part of Absolutely. your programming and education and stuff Very, is to let people who yeah. want to be volunteers know that this is a no-no area yeah. or they can work in addressing that area. Yeah, it's a big part of our work. And so we were talking earlier, you and I, about one of the challenges that we have as a program is there is a little bit of bureaucracy. Volunteers have to go through bureaucracy and the partner organisations that we support in country have to go through bureaucracy in order to be able to be part of the program. Um, Part of that bureaucracy is getting educated on child protection and we're just not willing to sacrifice that because it's such a critical part of it. It's, a, it's an important part of the education and there's a point at which you go, this part of the bureaucracy is important, understanding what a policy looks like, understanding how to implement it, understanding the volunteers, understanding how to behave safely and sign up to it. So it's, there's a safeguarding background that we are all, and as staff members, we're all up and, on, and believing in and supporting. Mm. It's just a necessary part of the program. Yeah, true. So, and we, there's the, for us, um, I obviously work in the public diplomacy team, which is a communications team. So part of our role is to make sure the volunteers and the partners and the staff are aware of their responsibilities and support that, the, the safeguarding efforts. But we also do try and seep the message out there just generally in terms of the public. So we obviously want people to volunteer through the Australian Volunteers Program. There's lots of opportunities and we'll get to that. But, um, but if you are looking at volunteering, then at least make sure that whoever you're volunteering with is considering this as an integral part of their volunteering. Like it's a bottom line, you know, you should never be um, scrimping on that part of your volunteering. Yeah. Just, it's, just, it's integral. Mm. And, the, you know, and there is, um well, yeah, like you say, part of the bureaucracy at all, most organisations that you would join as a volunteer, you know, you go through the bureaucracy side of it in terms of policies and governance and stuff, and they nearly all have to have, no matter what the organisation mm. is, a CPP, so yep. a child protection policy, which you either help draft or you have to be aware of and sign off. And um, it's actually... It doesn't matter it's, which organisation. It's a strength in a lot of ways of the way that we work. So. We've got um, offices in the countries that we work and the local staff will work with the organisations that we're there to support, that the volunteers are there to support. And so th that is a massive education process. So if they're not already familiar with child protection, then they'll have someone who'll walk them through, okay, what does child protection look like? What does a policy look like? And it becomes a really good um, way of capacity developing about child protection, child self-guarding, and so, you know, it's a cedar. So it's one of the few spaces that we actually acknowledge that we're being a little bit more pushy than we otherwise do. Usually we're very led by the partner organisation. We're there to facilitate their needs. Child protection is probably the area that we get a little bit pushier and go, actually, we've got some you know, black and white walls on this space. Yeah. Um, which leads us probably more to where you can talk about how you came to be working for AVI and came into the not-for-profit. Nowhere near is an exciting a story. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so my background, I also came in a very roundabout way to international development. I've only been working in the sector for a few years. I, um, as I was saying earlier, I actually came through the National Archives, so I was a classic art student, didn't know which way I wanted to go, English or history, um, ended up taking a graduate um, position with the National Archives of Australia, did my public service years for a few years, and then used having um, children as an opportunity to do a bit of a transition. Uh, the harsh reality of cultural heritage in Australia that working as a consultant as a cultural heritage um, when I, my babies were little and I was wanting to a bit of hourly stuff is that I could get paid more 
working as a sort of untrained comms person because I was a good writer that I could from someone who'd done my masters in cultural heritage. So I sort of fell into communications. I've always been an <coughs> English major and lots of <coughs> interest in comms. So then I started working, um, set, set up my own business in comms consultancy purely because it was convenient. I loved talking, writing, all those things. Um, and then when the youngest was at primary school, I was ready to actually start going, okay, what's the career step? What do I want to do? Where, you know, started getting curious and um, eager to learn new things. And very much the not-for-profit sector for me, the for-purpose sector was exactly where I wanted to be. Uh, the Stephanie Alexander Kitchen Garden Foundation um, was the first position I took in the not-for-profit sector and I worked there for a number of years and ended up leading their engagement team which is kind of sales, marketing, support, fundraising, grants, kind of everything in that space um, and then came across to AVI where I am now the communications manager working in the public diplomacy team. So AVI's um, that has been involved in international volunteering for 70 years. So long, long history, longer than the Australian government's history in international volunteering. <coughs> the first sort of official Australian international volunteer was um, supported by the precursor to what became AVI. And about 90%, um, a large chunk of what we do at AVI is support the Australian government's Australian Volunteers Program. The program is about 60 years old, so not as old as AVI, but you know, let's not be picky. Um, and so, but the government has been supporting international volunteering for about 60 odd years and the current iteration, so it's currently called the Australian Volunteers Program, but it's had lots of names over the years. It's just, this is its current name, um, the current sort of version set up in 2018. So we're in a sort of a five year contract period. If you want to look at it that way, it'll probably be rolled over and not too far away. Um, but it is part of this 60 year history. So it's, um, we try and bring all the volunteers under this concept of Australian volunteers and not to get too picky about who they volunteered with or when they volunteered. It's all part of the Australian Volunteers Program. Do you want me to keep talking? Oh, no, well, no, we can move on to a question. I've, I've got a question because one of the things we're obviously talking about is um, volunteering and e-volunteering. And yes. e-volunteering has obviously become very relevant because we can't travel. I yes. mean, you know, I for one, as people who know me here, um, I was in Vanuatu yeah. on my second volunteer assignment, had just got the extension done to stay for the rest of last year, instead of coming home in March, and <laughs> got thrown on a DFAT plane in March and yeah. brought home, so very unceremoniously at uh, midnight on a Saturday night. Um, yep. So yeah, so, and then obviously the opportunity then came once the dust settled a bit and we all got home automatically assignments had to be ended. So DFAT yes. said to yep. you guys, I'm assuming, is that all the volunteers need to be brought home, their assignments are immediately finished, It was a, officially. It, yeah, it was it was a the bureau, bureaucratic thing. So the, all of the, the assignments were on, in, all the volunteers were on the in-country assignments and it yep. was just because of the way they're set up yes. in the system, yep. Yep. it was just like, okay, they need to be ended. And we didn't, the reality is, so that was in March 2020, we didn't know what it meant for our partner organisation. So I might, backpedal just a second to make sure and we've talked about this already but make sure it's really clear the way that the Australian Volunteers program is set up is that it's a capacity development program and it's locally led so AVI um, has 22 offices as I said um, we're in 26 countries and the majority of our staff are actually local staff in these local countries so the key part of the relationship is actually the relationship that's happening in the in-country teams and they um, work with partner organisations and those partner organisations can be in any sector. They could be ministry, they can be a local NGO, they can be an international NGO, they could be a small medium enterprise, they can be, they have to meet certain bureaucratic requirements but we don't kind of pick one over the other. Um, and they'll work with the in-country teams to identify a need that they have for a skill set. So it's skills-based volunteering, um, they'll have identified a skills gap the in-country team will help them work out what an assignment might look like, like who's, is there going to be, are there going to be Australians with those skills? Um, and what will that look like? And then we'll recruit the, those volunteers to fill that skills gap. And the idea is that you don't have this ongoing roster of volunteers doing the same assignment. So volunteers are supposed to be working really hard to build the capacity of who they're working with and leave those organisations with those skills so that the next assignment, they need one, will look different and will build on it. It may not always work that way perfectly on the ground, as, as Jill can talk to, 
But that is absolutely the intent. The intent is um, sustainable development. So, um, backpedaling to COVID March 2020, when we made the decision to repatriate all the volunteers for functionality, just made it was much easier for us to just close all of those assignments. And then our first priority was to talk to all of our partner organisations and work out where they're at. So COVID, as you, I'm sure you're all aware, looked very different in very, in depending on <coughs> which countries. So some of our partner organisations, they suddenly were shut down and were having to work from home and they potentially didn't have the infrastructure to do any work. So there is, there are partner organisations that ceased to exist because COVID happened. Um, so the capacity of partner organisations to continue their work varied significantly. So one of the things that was important to us is whether or not they could support a volunteer we needed to know because there are certain requirements that you need to have to even be able to work with a volunteer. Um, so we did an assessment um, and got a sense of where all of our, our partner organisations are at. But to be honest, that's an ongoing process. So the, as you guys have experienced yourselves, COVID is continuing to change. So we can't assume that where they were at when they um, were asked in back in April or May or whenever we did that assessment last year, they, they're not necessarily going to be in the same space. So we have to be really careful about making sure we're actually meeting them where they're at with the needs that they have when they have them. Um, so that was absolutely the first port of call. Um, and then we were in the benefit, beneficial position to have already started doing some prototyping around what we called open volunteering. So um, we had, uh, back, in the, back in the days, pre-COVID days, we had conceived of the idea that, you know, remote volunteering is a, a, the way of the future and that maybe people are gonna wanna do a bit of both. They're gonna to wanna to do a bit of remote, a bit of in-country. Because the other thing to remember about in-country volunteering is that it's actually not accessible to a lot of mm. people. A lot of people do not have the means to be able to drop their life for 12 months and suddenly live in another country for so many reasons. So for lots of reasons, we'd already started to look at remote volunteering as a option for create, to enhance accessibility and just you know, improve outcomes for both partners and volunteers. Um, so when we did have to repatriate everyone, we were able to hit the ground running really quickly, use what we'd learnt about remote volunteering through this prototype that we'd done through our innovation area, um, and then open up remote volunteering to repatriate it all. So Jill would have been sent an email saying, you know, actually probably partner organisation was sent an email saying, do you have the capacity to work remotely with your volunteer? Do you want to? And if both opted in, off you go and they could do a remote volunteering, which only suited a small percentage of them. And so then we had, we used that learning from those repatriated volunteers to then imp continue to improve our remote volunteering initiative. And then it was open more broadly to the public earlier this year. Um, and we're still learning. So one of the things that's really um, exciting, I think for me uh, within this organization in AVI and the program, is it's a massive commitment to learning. So we have an innovation area and a monitoring and evaluation learning area, and both are constantly feeding in so our remote volunteering initiative at the moment is 12 weeks because initially that was what was shown to work really well. Nice, short, sharp assignments with really achievable aims. So maybe writing a policy, something that you could do really easily. And now what we're finding is our partner organisations and volunteers are going, no, 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 we want to do more. We wanted to work on some longer projects. We think we can make this work. So we'll probably be extending the length of our average remote volunteering assignment in the coming weeks, months. I'm not sure, I don't want to get in trouble from the volunteering services team about when that's going to happen. So um, we've had about 400 volunteer, remote volunteer assignments happen in the last, you know, just under two years now. Um, and the results are really positive. Yeah, it's, it's a very effective way. Like we're still learning in their um, strengths and weaknesses as a modality of a volunteering, but it's here to stay. It's not, so we will all be able to travel again, hopefully one day, whenever that wonderful day resumes, but I guarantee you remote volunteering isn't gonna go anywhere. So probably out of complete necessity, what it's done is opened up the fairly obvious difference between, you know, there are, I guess, different, you can use them for different focus aspects in terms of e-volunteering, like you say, very much you could do remote volunteering, where it is about, um, let's say governance, you know, support with governance and policy writing and yeah. things like that. Systems whereas, planning, whereas yep. volunteering in country is very much about being there and being more hands-on. So you have everything from, in, like I say, 
I work in sport for development, yep. so in actually being there for sports organisations, the number of times you have to be by a field or by a court or helping groups of kids do things, whatever it is, you need to be there on the ground. You can't do that remotely. Mm. Whereas sitting down and you know putting in reports, writing government mm. policies, creating partnership contracts and that, you mm. can do that remotely. So in fact, what it's done is out of necessity, but mm. obviously introduced two focused parts where you can keep that going. Absolutely. And yep. I do think that some of this is partner organisation and volunteer dependence. So Catherine, mm. I'm going to point to say, who, um, yeah. who works in archives, like that's a really yeah. good one to be able to do yeah. online. But also I wonder if sometimes organisations will also use it as an opportunity to get a volunteer, but they can't get in country. So as in someone, so it could be a way of tapping into skill sets. So we do have some professions that don't like to leave their career for a year to volunteering country so there might be some start being a bit adaptable of going yes it would be better if they were here but they're not we can't get them to come so one of the other things that we trialed was leadership mentoring and because you know once people get to a certain um, level at their profession they are less likely to take a gap year and go yes. travel until they retire so this idea of just spending a couple of hours mentoring every week those skill sets are still really valuable and, and sometimes underrepresented um, so there's, there is, I think, new opportunities that we will just start seeing open up as more people volunteer remotely. Yeah. yeah. And it's also, uh, um, I guess what it introduces to, and I'll bring Catherine in on this, because Catherine obviously is a returned volunteer like I am, but she chose to take up ADI Gopa and do some, continue to do some e-volunteering over the last 12 months. 12 months, yeah. So I'll get Catherine to talk a little bit about what she's been doing because as uh, Claire said, I got the same offer and I decided not to. I have actually been continually volunteering. I had one day off in between flying home and my laptop's open pretty much every day with my organisation to go to our food. But we made a Johnny right no offence, Claire. It's fine. But we just, we chose not to go the ADF because she did get the email. We chose not to do that because we're on some, we're so in sync and so close. We literally did, it was like I just wasn't in the office where I was normally in the office. Two days later, I wasn't in the office, so I was in my lounge room, but we just kept going. So we did it without ABI and we kept achieving all, doing all the work we were continually doing. Whereas there is reason for some people to do e-volunteering. So Catherine, do you want to tell us a little bit about what it's like doing e-volunteering, what was asked of you and, and how it works for you? Yeah, sure. Um, so I um, volunteer with an Until 
that sort of acknowledged by someone else outside of the organisation. We sort of probably didn't realise the, mm. um, the amount of knowledge that you had. I think mean, that was part of my role to mm. affirm and confirm mm. the knowledge that you already had mm. um, about, the, about her own role, what she's doing in the time. Um, yeah, yeah, and affirm what she's been doing. So I've been uh, having weekly meetings. So, so I finished at 12 o'clock and um, and found I was myself and the organisation quite happy to go into another 12 week um, uh, block. So I was you know, fortunate to uh, give me that, that um, for another 12 week period because I found that in the initial 12 weeks, because we don't have that period of time but as much um, as one in the country or something, um, I found that writing things like policies is, is more straightforward, but it, when it comes to more technical questions, it's hard to that sometimes to, to solve problems that they might have or um, to really get to the part of understanding what the issue is because we just don't have that time to be able to sit and say all the things about the technologies in question. So I've found that this second 12 week block has been, um, I, mean, I think the first period was, was productive, but the second period has been, I think, oh, I feel more productive in that um, you know, we had time to build up the relationship with those who were involved in online. Mm. Um, but you know, I've learned a lot more about the organisation and, and I think that um, having that, that extended period of that conversation with oh, some of my local colleagues there got started to think a bit more about different things that different projects that they can do that they might not have done previously. So, um, so yeah, there have been some challenges in terms of um, IT and the internet reliability and the internet None at the moment. <laughs> Too, to, sorry, I'm just 
for being a bit of a mobile cameraman here. <laughs> Just try and keep that going. Um, I think it's interesting too what, what I was saying before about the volunteering, um, creating two different areas of work focus. It's also different types of volunteering because one of the attractions for going and volunteering, doing, a, doing Australian Volunteers International and stuff, um, and those sorts of programs, is not only the work that you'd be doing as a volunteering, it's the whole immersion in a different life. You're going to live in a different country. You're generally, through programs that I'd like to use, you go through a language learning course, so you learn the, the language, the basic level of the language of the country you're going through, if it's not English. Um, uh, you socialise within the country, there are different within country managers or for different social functions and you go out and do trips out to maybe the local, for us in the Pacific, like the local mother's market or you go to church, you know, you might go visit one of the outside villages of the church just to introduce you and immerse you into the culture and things like that. You wouldn't get that with e-volunteering. So again, not only is the workload or the work mm. type very different in e-volunteering, but I imagine that some of the feedback you were getting too is that it's a very different volunteering experience than if you're thinking of, I'm going to be an Australian volunteer and mm. learn a whole lot about a different country. It's completely divergent because you're not obviously getting that experience from doing 12 weeks of e-volunteering. No, and so we're also, that's also proving to be a bonus in some areas as well. So uh, volunteering with a lot of data and a lot of information because it's been going for 60 years, 70 years for AVI, um, on who are common international volunteers and why they volunteer and and the, the, you know, the triggers for them, it's not necessarily the same for remote volunteers. So they're not necessarily, well, they're not motivated by travelling in country because they're not going to be travelling in country. So there's a whole different push. Um, and we're hoping we're going to do a little bit of, from the comms point of view, a little bit of understanding of who the audience is because it looks like it's a slightly different audience, um, which is really exciting because there's people who potentially actually don't want to travel and that's not the draw card but they actually do want to contribute their skills so they're motivated in a different way but they are still very motivated to volunteer but they just don't have so I, I imagine that most people in this room are very motivated to travel and very motivated by that part of it that isn't necessarily the common experience or the only experience for people in Australia there are actually people who do want to volunteer and there's a lot of local volunteers who um, don't want to do it from that point of view. So it's actually potentially tapping a whole new type of um, international volunteer. So with, uh, just, just on that, it was interesting, I noticed when I was away uh, both times, but especially the second time is that, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's a very much a change in the demographic of the people you would think of as volunteers. There was very much a period, I gather, in the 2000s where, uh, what's it called, IAD back then? So there was a very yeah. much a youth program yeah, yeah, where, yeah. you know, gap yeah. years and, yeah. and yeah. young ones just out of uni we're going and doing the volunteering that's very much focused on mm. them. Um, now you get a lot of, um, you know, older people and retirees and that who have got the time, you know, like I say, don't want to sit at home and play golf and they want to go out and help. There was something else I noticed is there's that middle group. There were a very large number of fa young families that started turning up in volunteering roles when I was in Vanuatu. Um, you know, with toddlers, everything from babies and toddlers to primary school age kids, well, actually even older kids, but generally mm. primary school age kids. They wanted a, you know, sea change or a life change, and they'd left their jobs. They'd rented out their, you know, mortgage-laden homes here in Australia, and they decided to come off and give their kids, generally, like I say, primary school age or younger, a different type of lifestyle. Mm. And I was amazed how many were coming actually on, like, like a family. family. So one yeah. or both parents had taken volunteer assignments, um, and the kids would get put, and they get some financial, financially supported with families and stuff. But I was surprised how many were doing that. So you get quite, there's, there's quite a huge range yeah, now. People they're still choose to volunteer. statistically the minority. So statistically, yeah, yeah. yeah, so your big peaks will happen. And so the youth volunteering isn't as much of a thing. And this is something that's really important to say. I think that's because of the skill level. To graduates, yeah. yeah. So currently, because we are such a skills based program, it really is targeted to people with a couple of years of professional experience under their belt. You're unlikely to be the top candidate in a volunteer assignment straight out of university because you do need to have. Yeah some of that practical experience under your belt. Although there are caveats to that because it does depend on the rule of applicants for any position. So um, nothing's ever set in stone. So a couple of years out when people, you know, there's a peak around the time that people have got a couple of years experience, classic Australian, but before they've actually bought yeah. their mortgage and had their kids yet. So there's when they're feeling a bit footloose and fancy free, 
And then you have the other spike is the retirees who have paid their dues and want to actually, so, and they, they're motivated by two different things. So the data tells us the people, the early professionals are actually often doing it as a career opportunity. So they are doing it for international development experience or some career boost mm. and it works. It's a very effective way to put something else on the CV that can be really valuable. Um, whereas the people who are at the other end of the professional spectrum at the end of their career are much more likely to talk about giving back. Mm. So they're much more likely to say, no, I, I have all these skills and I feel really lucky to have had the career that I have and now I want to give back. We made a really concerted effort um, to try and recruit families because they were underrepresented. So the, the, the people in the middle find it harder to travel. Um, and so there's been a very um, active recruitment because basically the um, DFAT, AVI, we want diverse volunteers. It's, it's no good for the experience for it to be the same people going out all the time. Um, or the same type of people going out all the time. So we really want to expose, and it's an accessibility issue, it's government money, should be trying to make this available to as many Australians from as many different backgrounds as we possibly can. Um, so that's where there has been a lot of active recruitment around those uh, age periods that are less represented. And just on that, there is, uh, for country volunteering, there's a, a dependent status, so that if you are classified as a dependent, which can be a partner, dependent just means that you are going as their dependent, then you get, um, there is some allowance for that as well. Yeah, and that's the big difference. Some people say you're going to do volunteering, um, but I can't afford to go because it's volunteering so I don't get paid anything. You do get paid something. It's just the Australian government classified as an allowance because it's a cost of living allowance. Basically, they've assessed the country you're going to and you, you are being paid what they assess you need to survive in that country because trust me, you have to pay utility bills, you have to pay rent, you have to pay for food. Internet is massively expensive, so all those things still have to be paid when you go away and you have, you're responsible for paying them. So you get an allowance to pay those. You don't get paid a wage. So you're not paying any income tax by the, from, to the Australian government because you're not being paid a wage, but you are being paid an allowance. So you do actually, you can actually survive financially. You won't save any money, but generally not out of pocket unless you're going to do a massive amount of touristy stuff on your weekends off. Or choose to live somewhere flasher. Mm. Well, yes, that's the other thing. It's accommodation is a big issue. The accommodation is usually set at what's, you know, yeah. reasonable. Yeah. Um, and that's a whole different can of worms mm. that opens up depending on who's running the accommodation mm. in the country you're in. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, that, that's a whole different thing. Um, Chris, did you want to move with did you want to sort of do a bit of a wrap and then open the floor to discussion or open the floor for discussion first? I Okay, so has anyone got any questions for Karen or Claire about some of what they were talking about? Be it child protection, be it how volunteerism fits into all that. We can go really deeply into volunteerism, but um, all the difference between volunteering or any volunteering. Um, I'm interested, probably more directed at Claire, um, about it doesn't sound blunt, but do the local partners want um, volunteers to go back or are most, as like a general sort of understanding, are they pretty happy with having rem remote volunteers? Oh, in, you mean do they want them to go in country or not? Yeah. It's really variable, incredibly right. variable. So some will go, we're just waiting to get in country volunteers back, tell us when we can have an in country volunteer. Some are like, no, this is working really well. Like it, there, there's just no one size. There's no one size fits all to the countries we work in, the regions we work in, all the types of organisations. So we just went through an annual reporting cycle um, and you, there is definitely a chunk of partner organisations that are waiting, but there is also some that are quite happy with remote volunteering. Any particular sector? No. Okay. It's surprisingly across the board. Okay. Yeah. Because um, I know just from me, pretty much since I got back, uh, it's died off a bit now because I've just stopped it, but almost weekly. When are you coming back? coming back? Like, I can't. Go. Your borders aren't open, my borders aren't open, I'm not coming back. So I know that's happened, and I'm not, not just from my organisation, but from other organisations within the sports development sector where I was getting emails from friends who I knew ran organisations and said, you know, are you, when are you going to be able to come back? When are the others going to be able to come back? Because we really need someone to do this in South or really have you know, this, this, this happening. Um, and uh, yeah, so there is demand there and they do want people back. The other thing is that we possibly should mention is that one thing COVID's done is that, especially in the Pacific, I suppose, North America, the Pacific, is it stripped a huge number of people out of their system, out of their everyday society. So it's not just tourists that aren't going to the Pacific anymore. 
So that's really curtailed their employment and um, their daily lifestyle. But also they lost a whole lot of us who were who had become part of their social sets as well as helping them. You know, we all started to be part of that, that part of the society, especially in the cities, but in the townships. But um, they lost all that. So it wasn't just volunteers too, it was NGO workers with NGOs and stuff, expats and stuff. Everybody got shipped out, shipped out, you know. And so their the economy too. Left, There's left. a lot less people buying and selling stuff yeah, as well. And that's so the thing. That it's, there's an economic the impact going. to that as well. Yeah, so they really do want a lot of people back, um, mainly, mostly volunteers. I think in Vanuatu we had like 50 50-odd volunteers in Vanu across yeah, Vanuatu. Vanuatu is one of the bigger ones. Yeah, I, w yeah, I wouldn't generalise. And I don't know the sector data and well enough to make any yeah. claims. So, I, yeah. so it does vary, I know. You know there'll mm. obviously be some who have said they can survive, but I know just from my... Anecdotally, um, I've been consistently after the last 18 months when it comes back. First plane that goes from Melbourne to Port Vila, I'm on it, but it's not happening for a while. So. And it won't be permanent. Um, sorry, so any other questions we have for Karen? I've got a I, no, I just didn't explain that bit. So AVI is an NGO. So AVI is an um, uh, Australian-based not-for-profit organisation, charitable purpose and all the ways that it, that's normally set up. We, the Australian Volunteers Program is the program that the Australian Government funds, the Australian Government funded International Volunteering Program, um, and that is managed by AVI in consortium with the Whiteland Group and Cardno. So AVI is a managing contractor, in a consortium with Cardno and the Whiteland Group, and we manage the Australian Volunteers Program on behalf of DFAT. Thank you. I really should have said that at the start. Um, um, follow up question, which is what's the relationship with um, ABB, Australian Business Group? Does it, is it still around? No, I think they wrapped up. Oh, okay. I thought ABB wrapped up. Because we had a lot of ABV volunteers yeah. in 2017, but there were virtually none in 2019. I should have researched the answer to this question. Yeah. So there are still some around. I can't be able to tell you more than that. Yeah, mate, you might have to answer your own questions. We were told, <laughs> we were told that was being wrapped up because ABVs only ever did three months stints. They never did longer than three months, am I right there? I think. And yeah, that therefore sounds their whole volunteering right. experience was different. They were put up in. Um, uh, motels and things, and they were paid. It wasn't They're an not, allowance; they were paid differently. It was a it was a very different system. Yeah, yeah. I don't know enough about it. Yeah. Sorry. Watch this space. Yeah, okay. it'll be interesting. Yeah. I've met plenty of the alumni because they've come through on the program, mm. but um, yeah, I don't know enough about it. And AAD was another program. So that was one of the government-funded youth ambassador program, and they decided to discontinue it basically because they wanted to focus on skills-based. Right. Yeah. So we've got people speaking tomorrow in Canberra who work part in the AAD program, and they yep. talk about as an outsider because I've done any of these myself, but um, my interaction with people says that. Amazing experience mm. that they built on mm. to build a career in yep. the sector. Yeah. Is there any chance of an AI type program? Getting? That might be a question for DFAT, but it's, it's, it might have been a fantastic program for the graduates. Mm. So, one of the things to remember, what we've talked about a lot, is we're really focusing on the partner organisation's capacity. So, the outcome, I'm not sure I haven't looked at any of the research, but the focus is for us on giving skills to our partners, not necessarily sending them graduates. Does that make sense? So the, yeah. it may be that there wasn't enough outcomes mm. happening on the ground. So absolutely, I think there's lots of, you know, ads who run around and, and benefited a lot from it. Yeah. But I'm not sure if the benefits were as much on the ground as they are looking for now. Mm. That's a speculation though. I feel like I, I need to just caveat yeah. that with that. I had a bit of involvement. We wrote the child yeah. safeguarding policy there and there was many issues <laughs> with volunteers doing stuff they shouldn't have been doing and oh, 
So yeah, there was there was there were issues as well with it, but I think it was right. It was um, whose needs are we meeting here? Mm. Our white centric needs to get more skilled young people back in our country doing what we want them to do, rather than, and it's for their CV and their career progression, all of which are fine, but. I think there was a bit of that going on. So it's the white saviors again and the colonial approach to, yeah, we'll, we'll get something from this for us to take back. And it would be interesting to see if there could be some middle ground, if mm. you could reintroduce some yeah. sort of a youth program in association, like from mm. the government, DFAT through, say, AVI or mm. something, and maybe a couple of the universities in terms of, well, I know... That's what a lot of the student programs, yeah. yeah. So got I think happening with ACU, I know, and I know a couple of... Yeah, there's a, some good that. student programs yeah. that are kind so of... Maybe we that find that. some middle ground in that. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know I've had quite a few of my students this year in different subjects who have said to me, you know, would you recommend volunteering? That would be really a good thing to do. And you can see, even in talking to them and about... Uh, and we cover a lot of the subjects we've done in terms of assumptions they make because... They're Australian young people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are certain assumptions we make about the world. Yeah. They haven't had the experience of the world. And so mm -hmm. there are things when they want to get into development, there are things that they're thinking which are just not based in reality because no fault of their own. They haven't had that experience and they don't know what the world out there is like to any great yeah. deal. But they're studying development or they're wanting to work in development. So without that reality check, mm. they can't know what you know whether they're designing a project to do yeah. project management, whether they're getting into advocacy, whatever they're doing, it's hard to expect them to have a reality, a, a real perception of what is needed. Yeah, I, but we've got to make sure that that, then that experience doesn't come at cost yes. to the partner organisations. Yeah. Not, yeah. So it's, it is, that, that's got to come first. Yeah. yeah, so it's a bit of a... The do no harm in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's right. Yes. 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 That's a thing you hear a lot of in students here in Australia. Do no harm is the big thing. Well, that's my everyday work. <laughs> so that system strengthening policy legal reform that I talked about that we do in Cambodia, in Thailand, in Indonesia, we've completely shifted policy and legislation away from residential care or if there are going to be facilities or orphanages, shelters, boarding schools, have, they have to comply with the UN standards of alternative care, the government has to monitor them, they have to be registered, so as well as the physical conditions of the building, which they obsess more about, I'm going, no, it's the psychological safety of the children, and it's really hard to measure, but that's way more important than how many beds, I mean, I, I've written all over this, but here's a picture of, you know, about 20 beds in a very small space, looks lovely, they're all nicely clean, etc., but like, would you want to be in a room with 20 kids? So um, we're talking about the, the child safeguarding, the qualifications of the staff, the ratios of staff to children, who comes and goes. Because again, if they are a registered facility with the government, because the government do have registered shelters, we do all the training of the staff. They can't use physical punishment because physical punishment is rife, sexual abuse is rife, emotional abuse and neglect. So it's training people um, with the skills to how to look after children and how to not use violence. Um, so parenting and caregiving without violence, teaching without violence in the schools is all part of my day-to-day -day work. So I'm working in all those countries and we've had numerous, numerous policies and laws enacted and they've all signed on to the alternative care standards. We've noticed, um, we've got 
great reductions in the numbers of children in institutions and Indonesia has um, completely shifted the policy paradigm so the money's not going into institutions, it's incrementally, because you can't close them down overnight when there was half a million children, but incrementally the money is now going into uh, the social work workforce so we've rewritten all the curricula at the university to make it a professional social work degree we're doing that in about four countries so we've got the workforce to look after the children that do need case management and families who are vulnerable um, and then the aftercare um, so, and then the protection the social protection and access to services so that's the day work <laughs> We've certainly caught plenty. Getting them in jail is in a whole other matter. Um, and yes, we have had people who have been a politically... Uh, I mean, we have ministers in Indonesia who run the institutions. They're private businesses. So, they're, so we had one minister and she and we were trying to get all these policies through and she was actually running several of them of herself so complete conflicts of interest so that's tricky politics when it, and indonesia and australia you know um so we had to go behind her and to the director general and take so you learn about this is where you get your advocacy skills honed um but yes and, and again if it's an australian running and, and it's following the money trail i mean if i was going to do a normal presentation on Rethink Orphanages, I would tell you about the money. You've got to follow the money to find out who's accountable. And there's no accountability over there. If you're just sending money and you're, you know, you, I mean, people say, oh, but you know, I used to do a lot of work for the um, Catholic Education Office and they go, oh, but can we give it to this little nun in the hills of Vietnam? And I'm going, oh yeah, right. Well, that's a red flag right there. <laughs> I went to a convent. Uh, the only abuse I ever experienced in my life was at a convent with nuns, I can tell you. But um, the money trail and the accountability, and that's why the, our work with the ACNC is so important because they're, we're registering charities and we're sending Australian money, or donors are, but we don't know what happens. And then they send it to places that have signed on standards, but they're, the government in that country is then not monitoring and holding people accountable. And they're certainly not asking the children what their experiences are like, which is the other aspect of our work. We talk to the children and the parents. So there's a lot of work going on. But a couple of strings to your bow are now criminology and forensic accounting. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> I actually did study criminology again, <laughs> only because I was fascinated by it, but I didn't really know that it would be that useful. But hey, I ended up working with sex offenders, pedophiles, and rapists, so it you did come in handy. Exactly. So, um, oh, God, I was going to ask now. Oh, no, I don't know what I was going to ask. So, one thing I always find fascinating in these things is, is the stakeholder relationships. And when you're talking about the processes, the sort of work you have to do on a daily basis and chasing down these things, chasing down the, you know, these issues and the people who run these places and that, um, you're obviously in these countries going to have to do it through the government, I'm assuming, so yeah. you're going to have to have a lot of communication and partnerships and relationships with governments, all of which are not necessarily straightforward and above board, in fact I would think most. How much is mm. that pretty much the majority of your time, those hurdles? Um, yeah, look, we do. So it's our staff in country that we ensure. I mean, the wheel me, the Ferengi, as they call me, the white foreigner. So they use and abuse me, and I go, that's fine. I'm quite cool with that. But they wheel me in to tell the ministry stuff. And I go, it's not my place. But they say, but they'll listen to you, Karen. They don't listen to us because yeah. you look like you do, and we look like we do. And I go, this is terrible. But okay, do what I do. What I'm told then. But it's them doing the work. Um, yes, I may well have trained them and helped with advocacy skills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and, and they translate and sometimes then when I'm really getting, you know, impatient with it, and of course I have to be, you know, very diplomatic, etc. But I might be, you know, in the car on the way there and go, right, if Mr. So-and-so does it, I'm going to blah, 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 and I'll be going off and they go, no, you won't, no, you won't. And then I'll go, and then I'll say it in my most diplomatic way and KMRA, you will go, I'm not translating that. Or else they'll just go, la, 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 la. And I go, you didn't translate a word of what I said, I just know you didn't. And they go, when did you learn Thai, Karen? I go, I know I need to. But, um, but we've got good relationships, our staff. And, but over the years, I've noticed that they will go. But these guys all sit in uniform. The ministry people are like military. And I go, no wonder children are scared of them. They're like soldiers. I was having flashback to my childhood growing up in Northern Ireland, being invaded by the British. I go, oh, this is terrible. But now we've got the social workers out of uniform. They're in plain clothes. That was a big coup. So, yeah, lots of 
advocacy, but um, it's getting our staff to stand. But they're doing amazing things. Yeah. They're really, um, because they're too polite. <laughs> we're, we're just like used to bogging on. Oh, yeah. But no, they're bogging on in their own very, very lovely way, in their own, and they're getting things done. And that's a, it's a sheer joy to watch. Yeah. And that's when, that, that's when you feel like you can tick some boxes that you're actually getting Yeah, I just something. go along as a passenger now, you know, <laughs> they take me to show me things. <laughs> Thank you very much. What an interesting discussion. Absolutely fascinating. And, um, and such an important one. Mm. And we will put the, um, the recording on the internet. And there will be one in Canberra and one in Sydney and we will record those too because they're going to be really different aspects and volunteering is a really important part. It comes up, I think, at every single event that we do. So thank you both so much. Slightly smaller audience from your last one, uh, which was 2,700 people yesterday, Karen. <laughs> um, but the key with this group is that we're all really motivated and group that really want to make a difference driven by purpose without a doubt and uh, will make a huge impact in the world going forward mm. so thank you both for coming you um i have for both of you a fabulous women in aid development month <laughs> thank you excellent to take home thank you very thank much very you. very um highly sought after <laughs> yes. limited edition i don't have one <laughs> <laughs> that we get information um, out to people. We encourage interviews because we want to see you as the leaders of tomorrow. The people in the positions like they're a parent or a CEO or sitting on a board like I do. It's so important. We've got a great sector and you see all those fabulous statistics that says that in the corporate sector, they think they're doing pretty well getting almost 30% We've got 50%, over 50% of women in CEO roles. Not quite as good on the director side of things, but we've still got a lot of directors. But this is a sector of 80% women. So until we've got 80% women in the senior leadership roles and 80% women on boards, then I'm still going to be quite busy um, introducing people, connecting people. We've got a great um, mentoring program. It's growing and building. It's going to be in its second year next year. Um, we've got a new program that's coming up, an observership program to take one person each year to come along with us to the board to take that board journey for a year and see what's involved in being a director to see if you are interested in that. We will, as a caveat, be taking people who are further on in their careers. So that's and we have, um, we've got five events planned next year, all looking at different areas. So it may not be the key area you're looking on, but as you've heard tonight, both Claire and Karen have lots of experience of things that help no matter which area of the um, sector you work. So um, please come again. We love seeing you. And uh, don't run away now because we've got wine uh, to drink. Plenty of wine. <laughs> Plenty of wine, cold pizza, I'm sure they'll look it up for us. And um, again, Karen and Claire, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, much. pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Thank you. Hey. Oh, and thank you, Jill. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs>